Okay, uh, thanks, Jitesh. Thanks, everyone. I think 300 people as participants is, is pretty good to see. Uh, so I think all uh, Nikhil, Sanjay and Jitesh have covered quite a few things already. So let me try and keep it brief. Uh, and I'll focus it on a few areas which I thought uh, are worthwhile. Uh, firstly, uh, you know, what do we do at Tap Chief in itself? Uh, at Tap Chief, we basically help independent freelancers, consultants, uh, solopreneurs, etc., find great opportunities with businesses, right? Uh, to work on short-term projects, we've been primarily focused on technology, marketing, and design. Uh, you know, with projects or gigs ranging from 60 minutes all the way up to six months. Uh, and we've had a range of customers, uh, primarily India-based so far. Uh, but that's quickly changing uh, in the post-COVID world, and I will touch upon that as well. Uh, so yeah, we have customers like uh, Hindustan Unilever, Pearson, a lot of upskilling platforms like Upgrads and Cleaner, uh, who all leverage the talent on our platform in order to get a lot of their critical aspects done very fairly quickly, right? Uh, now coming to, you know, before I jump into different aspects of sales, uh, so let's just take a step back and wonder what has changed, you know, in the last six weeks primarily. And if you're especially selling to businesses, what has changed for businesses, right? So in more often than not, uh, businesses have been negatively impacted. Uh, the way we view it is actually we've put it into three buckets. One is severely impacted. That is, you know, a lot of it in hospitality, F&B and so on and so forth. Uh, then the second category is, uh, is people who are indirectly impacted because, you know, they were either serving the first category or something like that, right? And the third is, you know, businesses who are seeing an upswing, which is in ed tech, which is in gaming, social media, uh, you know, the space we are in and so on and so forth. So firstly, you know, it's very important as somebody trying to sell to any form of business to be very cognizant of, you know, which, uh, one of these three buckets to the prospective business lie under, right? Now, before you, you know, really think about sales, I think one of the things uh, we did internally and, you know, would very much encourage everybody to do so is to go back and reflect as to what is the purpose of the product or the service that you were kind of trying to sell and trying to build out and kind of really reword it and rethink about it in a post-COVID world, right? Uh, because what you'll find is that in a lot of cases, uh, the prominence of your product or service has drastically improved or increased, especially if you're falling in one of the upswing sectors. What this does, it, it does is that it helps your teams firstly understand the importance of your existence and your business and your product and your service in a post COVID world. Right? So for instance, uh, in April and March, you know, uh, Again, I haven't shared this publicly yet, but in both in March and April, we had our best months where we kind of actually delivered the highest payouts to freelancers for doing the most amount of work ever in our lifetime, right? Now, for why, when the scenario in general has been that of unemployment and layoffs and pay cuts and so on and so forth across the board, the fact that we could continue to deliver incomes to so many people, or hundreds of people on the platform was extremely inspiring for the team. Similarly, the way we were able to enable a lot of businesses to continue to operate and continue to function by virtue of the talent that they were leveraging on our platform was again a very inspiring aspect for every one of our team members to try and do more and more uh, in order to serve these customers and users much better, right? So first things first, uh, I feel that a lot of you should really wonder about the purpose of the company and product and see what, how that has evolved. And you'll find yourselves, uh, you know, a lot more better mentally uh, to, you know, attack and continue to grow from there, right? Because aside from the aspect of different aspects of sales could be prospecting, conversion, uh, lead generation, etc. Those are ultimately the technical side of things, but you, as well as your members of your team should be rightfully in the firstly in the right mental state to go and do well in all of those places. So I have found that this has helped. Uh, so would encourage you guys to maybe try it out coming specifically to sales, um, especially when it comes to, uh, B2B sales, right? I think one of the first things you know, we all need to revisit is, you know, our ideal customer sets, our ideal prospects uh, who could, you know, eventually become customers, right? So the categorization of, you know, into are they severely impacted, indirectly impacted, or are they seeing an upswing can tell you a lot about who to focus on today, 
right? Uh, so obviously anybody in the upswing side, and if you can come and add value there, then you obviously have a much, much better uh, way of converting them into a customer today, as opposed to somebody who's severely impacted, right? Uh, they're obviously scrambling around to save costs, to figure out uh, what kind of things can they optimize and so on and so forth. So the acceptance for a you know external service or product today to try and do that would be fairly minimal in my opinion so thereby you know you should really go from three to one that is focus on sectors which are uh, you know seeing an upswing uh, then go to you know the next sets right now also uh, again i think sanjay brought about you know what are the most important board meeting points each one of them are discussing I think that's a very good way for you to orient a lot of your communication. Uh, so firstly, you know, just broadly putting this into prospecting, you know, initial communication and thereby ultimately conversion from a prospecting standpoint, focus on upswing sectors and don't just use a plain vanilla method for each sector. Each sector has its own nuances. Like for instance, if you take ed tech, ed tech has at least four different subsectors today, right? From K-12, test prep, upscaling, uh, ed tech tools and so on and so forth. So each one of them will have very, very different needs. So the idea has to be again to go deeper in each one of them and wonder about it. And when you're prospecting, I think another good thing to really focus on today is, you know, typically you can go about it two ways, right? You can go about it with cold messaging, either cold email, LinkedIn messages, phone calls, etc., or you can go via a person who can do a warm introduction for you or by somebody who maybe an existing customer knows uh, somebody else and they can recommend you. I think it's today is the best time to really focus on those warm introductions, warm referrals, etc. Because in a post COVID world, you know, as, as zoom prisoners or any other term, right? Everybody is facing very, very different struggles, right? Somebody, uh, Bear in mind that the stakeholders you're trying to sell to are also trying to figure out if somebody is above 40 or something like that, they're trying to figure out how can they manage their kids, homeschooling while they're figuring out their own work, right? So there are different nuances as well from a personal and a social standpoint, which you keep need to bear in mind, right? So from a prospecting standpoint, try your best to look at individuals and not just companies, right? Trying to see who are people in a particular sector that you know, or people you know who could introduce you to them uh, is I think a very good way to prospect and increase your chances of converting them to a customer eventually. When it comes to just communication about the first level of communication in order to you know, evoke a response, in order to get them on a call or so on and so forth, try to make sure you're reaching out with a sense of empathy, try to uh, help them at least understand why you're specifically reaching out don't send messages like hi and then expect somebody to respond with a hello and then go on to, you know, actually, you know, speak about what you were intending to go with, you know, the entire messaging right at the first go, help them craft a concise, but a crafty message or an email, which you can send across where you explain why, who you are, why you're reaching out and how you can potentially help them. So today, making sure that the messaging is that of being helpful to each other, as opposed to striking a deal or striking a sale is going to be that much more important because you don't want to come across as somebody uh, you know who doesn't care about everything else that's happening in the world but only cares about the sale of their service or product right you want to make sure that you understand where the other person is also at uh, so some tips and tricks always uh, you know suggest potential time slots you could speak at uh, the way you can have that conversation uh, you know, where can you really help list that out in bullet points so that it's easily readable, consumable uh, across, even if it's an email or on a LinkedIn message, right? Uh, so I think those are some things. The last piece I want to focus on in, with respect to, you know, the conversation itself and trying and making a sale, right? So typically there are, in at least in my book, I feel that there are two ways you can make a sale. You can convince somebody that you can help them make money and that's why they should purchase your service and you are a critical aid in that juncture or you can kind of come from an approach that you can you know, by using your product or service people can save money right today is probably one of those times uh, and typically what i i have seen is that 
people, especially salespeople, orient themselves in one of two areas, right? They either always orient their pitches from a make money perspective or from a sales. I think today is the time where every salesperson has to combine both of the benefits of both because you know you need to make sure that you communicate ultimately that what is what is what is the upside by using your product or service and also what are the downsides that a potential customer is limiting by adopting your service or uh, thing right uh, like for instance in our case we have been telling SaaS companies that hey content marketing is one of your key aspects of lead generation so if you increase the amount of content you're generating by engaging with content creators on our platform you'll have more leads and but thereby potentially you can make more sales right and we're also saying in the same use case that you know today you cannot hire as many people to generate that level of content so by doing that on our platform you're also significantly saving logistics maintenance and all sorts of cost by engaging with creators on our platform right so as you can see, typically, you know, in the past, we used to just focus so much more on the fact that, hey, you can generate more leads if you generate more content. And that's about it, right? But today, we understand that everybody is trapped for cash. We understand that, you know, a key focus on bottom line is so pertinent for everyone. So as a salesperson, if you're not addressing that elephant in the room right from the get-go, you're leaving yourself or at a disadvantageous position because a prospect can come back and say, Hey, I just don't have the money for this today, right? Uh, so you address the elephant in the room right at the get-go and tell people how you're able to do so. So these are a couple of quick uh, insights, again, in terms of motivating teams and so on as well, right? Uh, I think it's very critical that, you know, you're in touch with your teams very, very often, uh, you know, uh, and I understand that maybe Zoom calls every day is not a viable solution. But you know you can what you can do is resort to things like voice notes, video notes, and in fact you can do the same with your customers. You can use tool, tools like Loom, etc. Where let's say if you were doing a physical demo in the past, but in some sense if you can try and make that digital, uh, but not to make it monotonous and boring, you can use tools like Loom where you're running a prospect with a presentation with your face along with it, right? And maybe attach that in the first email so that it can come across as personalized. So yeah, so there are a bunch of things you can do, uh, but these are were some very quick uh, tips and tricks potentially that, you know, across these couple of areas you can follow, but happy to kind of, uh, you know, go into certain, you know, depths of different aspects over the Q&A. Great. Uh, thanks, Shashank. Um, that was, I think, super helpful and more importantly, uh, very tactical. Uh, we have a few questions. I'm just uh, going to take them uh, one by one, some are a little more uh, broad based, so we'll, we'll try and cover all that we can. Uh, naturally, I think Shashank, let me start with you since you were the last one who spoke. Um, the first one is um, Have you guys closed any B2B deals on one call, or you know, have you seen, uh, or how, 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 how long is it usually taking uh, for you to close a deal in these, in these times? You're on mute, Shashank. Shashank, you're on mute. Sorry, my bad. Uh, so yeah, so I would not really emphasize too much on trying to close a deal in the first call or you know something like that, right? Because I think that's the wrong metric to really optimize for, especially in these times. Uh, I think what is going to be critical is to what extent are you becoming important to that potential customer, right? Uh, so and that extent of importance is quite crucial here. So even if it takes you a bunch of calls, maybe even two weeks to close that customer, but they're very, very important to your proposition. They are very serious about, you know, leveraging that product or service quite actively. Uh, they're trying to figure out with you what is the best way to increase that adoption and so on and so forth. They are much, much better deals to close today as opposed to something which you can very quickly close on a call and move on, right? Because I think, you know, because that if you're able to do that, it also communicates to an extent the lack of depth in that relationship. Because how much can you really cover in 60 minutes to say that you're a very integral part? So I would firstly say that that's the wrong metric to optimize for. But of course, the right metric to track continuously as to what is it trending like, right? What we, we are seeing is that, of course, a lot of the upswing, upswing sectors where you can go ahead and add immediate value are 
pretty fast today, right? They are moving fairly quickly. Another thing that we're seeing is that a lot of times previously where you had to go across a chain of hierarchy, maybe because of, you know, everybody operating from their homes or whatever it may be, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the causation, but, you know, today reaching out to a BU head or a director or a VP at a large company and trying to close a deal with them is probably easier than ever, especially if they're in an upswing sector, because, you know, if you're making a lot of sense and if they feel you can add value, they are responsive fairly quickly and they're getting on calls on their own because before it used to be a massive exercise of trying to fight for a slot on their calendar where they were, you know, which used to be burdened with direct reports, other external commitments they would have, et cetera, et cetera. And last but not the least travel in itself, right? Today, a lot of those things have been broken. So again, my suggestion on even the prospecting bit would be to try and start from the top, right? If you can try and close a deal with, uh, you know, for a potential customer, you know, if you can try and directly reach out to the VP, business heads, executives, as opposed to trying and going bottom up, uh, you know, today, I think you're, you'll naturally see uh, if the proposition is fit, fitting in well, if you have done good research on who should your prospect be, why in that sector, you can add a lot of value. And if you're able to communicate that extremely well in a concise manner, I think you will see fast conversions quite seamlessly, uh, as long as that's taken care of. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Ashank. I think just as a follow up uh, to what you were saying, and it's actually another question, I think it's also interesting, would love to hear your thoughts on how you're balancing the whole, you know, uh, in sales, there are obviously largely two buckets, right? There is price and there is the longevity of the contract. Right. Um, and, and in these times, I think while, while everybody's trying to be very, very pragmatic, there are those who will try and squeeze on both sides, right? Whether, and how do you really not make sure that you're undervaluing your, your product to a future uh, sales prospect? So is there any particular pattern that you guys have followed or you see as a way forward to try and balance these two out? Uh, I think that would be good to know. Right. Um, so yeah, see, I, I believe that longevity is always better than, you know, the value of the contract today, right? Uh, because uh, what I feel is that, you know, if, you, if your product does what it says it's expected to do and uh, you're able to stay with a potential customer for a long time, albeit at a smaller value, what happens inevitably is if that customer is going to grow, they're not going to go to somebody else to kind of come and serve that need, right? They're going to stick with you because of the inherent trust, etc. And I think the level of trust that people will build in these times, especially for ones uh, who have added value to their businesses in these times, I think will be really hard to forget, right? Because uh, before it used to be, hey, I met you at this conference, I met you at this event, and that's how we've gone ahead and done so and so. Today, I think in these times, in the coming months, people are going to remember that, hey, I was struggling on this aspect, and this service came about, and they sold it so quickly for us, right? So I will, you know, and we continue to use them. So I would, again, not really, I would definitely, if I had to make a very precise choice, I would definitely pick longevity over the ticket size today. Uh, coming from, you know, how to address some of those tough questions where people are maybe trying to squeeze you out, et cetera, right? I think it's, you know, today is also a good time to be very transparent, right? Uh, you know, where... Traditionally, again, this may be very unconventional and maybe a lot of people may not agree with it. Uh, so use it at your own you know, caution. But I, I feel that uh, being a little more transparent about your own costs and own margins in trying to serve a customer, uh, maybe not at a margin level, but the different costs that you have to incur in order to kind of serve the customer well. Being a little more transparent about that and helping customers understand that, hey, if I don't charge you at least this much, I will not be able to serve you well and thereby to ensure that, you know, this is served well for you and your purpose is actually, you know, accomplished. We need to charge you at this rate and conversations like that with a lot more transparency and helping the under customer also understand your own prevailing situations, I feel can be quite helpful to na navigate some of those. Jitesh, uh, can I just add to that? Yes, uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, so, you know, I think pricing, especially for uh, Indian customers, is quite different from international, right? So if you look at both those levers, uh, 
it's interesting you know one once pricing falls to the lowest common denominator like you know just good consumers or bad consumers where it's very difficult to take that up again so i think this is where founders and sales people also have to be creative right there are different ways to achieve the same objective but in a different way so for example let's say it's uh, let's say it's look at healthify me right uh, let's say there's a certain package in sort of reducing the price uh let's say a certain package included yoga and uh, you know nutrition and and the package had like 10 uh, you know 10 settings you could do 11 for the same right you're not really low in price or if it's a productivity tool you're saying that if you're going to give five licenses uh, 50 licenses maybe you give 60 or 5 to 6 uh because uh the risk with uh, you you might win the deal but it's very difficult to raise prices again and then people see you in a certain yeah. way so i think you can achieve sometimes lend in and retain your product integrity and the whole value prop of your product and just do it in a very creative way without really uh, sort of dropping your perception brand perception i think that's important great uh, thanks sanjay i think uh, let's stay with you uh, and and one question uh, directed to you uh, will be what's 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 your opinion on the current uh, digitization trends in the supply chain and manufacturing side uh do you feel customers are going to continue uh you know investing in some of these technologies and i know you touched on digitization briefly but some some broader thoughts would be helpful yeah no it's a very broad question if you think of again i'm thinking of again tap chief future of work i think the disruptions in the productivity chain in the sort of human relations working chain and supply chain are going to be the largest uh everything from e-commerce delivery to home to warehouse automation Uh, uh i think are going to become sub sectors and they're going to become very interesting because if you think about if you just bring china into the equation right you look at everything uh, i mean china is intertwined and touching every aspect from big pharma to manufacturing to robotics to everything right our phones so in that sense i think new opportunities will open up and certainly we will look at it uh also uh, uh i think thinking very carefully about you know do you really have to manufacture can you license it can you outsource it uh just imagine giants like nike right uh, think of people like that who have an apple who have such large factories in china what they're going through so absolutely i think supply chain inefficiencies will 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 be very interesting to look at just how product just how productivity uh, inefficiencies and efficiencies and efficiencies will take off so yes i think it'll touch and that will touch that touches logistics delivery uh, transportation it's going to be huge so absolutely yes great uh, thanks sanjay uh, so i'll take up a couple of next one 